Good. Uh, thank you, Simon, and thanks to JC for the invites over the years. Yeah, this time is different. We're doing it online, so you can see the people. So this the new times that we live in. So it's been quite a tough period, as all of us have experienced it. And we'll touch on uh, start with the local market and then move on to to the offshore markets. So talk about the SA listed property sector. So most of you quite familiar with it's the assets that we see as we drive around, go shopping. Um, so you'll probably relate to most of the issues we're going to talk about. So it's a market that's been the darling of uh, the JSE uh, with uh, superior returns over the last couple of years. But the last uh, probably two to three years, things have changed and they've actually become worse as we've seen um, so far this year. So what this slide shows, it shows the total return so far in 2020. So the numbers are up to end of September. We've seen the sector fall uh, by almost close to 50%. So the biggest decline was in March. So one thing to point out there is that the property sector was already declining before COVID-19. And then COVID-19 came with level five lockdown. So that huge actually decline in the property um, um, prices and then some recovery as you go along, people thinking maybe COVID is ending and then moving to level three or level four and the sector falls again. So it's been very tough. So you can see two indices at the bottom there. We've got the SAPI, that's the SA listed property index, and then the OLP, that's all property index. So all property index basically includes the UK and it suffered more mainly because of uh, the UK stocks like Inti and Hammerson falling quite sharply. So that's year to date uh, returns. And if you look at over time, as you can see, you've had a property in red, just to make it more visible. Uh, for year to date, down 46% over the last 12 months, down about 46%. Even if you look further, let's say over five years, 10 years as well, the returns haven't been uh, very exciting. Over 10 years, only 1.8% annualized returns. I'll just point out that this is mainly because of uh, this year's negative returns and uh, 2018 um, to a certain extent. But this year is actually tracked down basically everything and property has delivered more like cash returns on an annualized basis over the last uh, 15 years. So the big question is where to uh, from here? So what has happened? What caused property to fall uh, by that kind of level of magnitude? So what you can see, you can see all these where it's discount, rental deferrals. So this applies to uh, the discounts offered by the property industry group, uh, which were anywhere between 55 to 100%, and that applied mainly in the retail space, and to a certain extent in the office market and in the industrial sector, but on a case-by-case -case basis. So with these kind of uh, discounts from level one to level two, that's quite huge. So they do have an impact on ends. That's why the market looks first, okay, the ends are going to come down, I'm going to get lower distributions. That's why you saw the sector fall uh, quite a lot. We'll touch more later on as we go more into the retail space to see that impact on, um, on these property companies as well as uh, trading. So that's assistance provided to the uh, tenants by the property landlords. And then on the other side, what was provided to the property landlords or the listed property companies? So it's been quite a big topical issue over the last uh, couple of months that property companies wanted some sort of relief as well. But what they got, um, through the JSC and FSCA was uh, basically two months extension to pay out um, distributions. So previously uh, they had four months, so within uh, your year end uh, to pay distributions. And just give an example, let's say if you had a June year end, you had up to end of October to pay out the distributions or dividends to investors. But now that's been extended by two months to say December, which is good because it gives you time as well to follow up or chase maybe your tenant we deferred rent to you to give you some rent over time and then you can pay it out to investors as uh, distributions. So that's not probably the relief that property companies were looking for. They wanted more uh, from the national treasury and SARS, uh, like tax relief or tax dispensation. So I put that uh, as yet or kind of brackets that uh, probably more unlikely uh, if we are to be uh, honest, given the challenges the economy is facing and lots going on. So property companies have to pay out at least 75% of their earnings to investors as distributions. Whereas previously during the good times of 100%, but now they need to retain some of the income. So 
just to help mainly with the debt uh, levels which have been actually uh, spiking. I will show you in the next uh, few slides. So you will see payout ratios coming down from 100% to probably 75% basically across the board, apart from one or two strong companies. So why is that? Is that uh, before property companies didn't have to retain income. They could go to the equity market uh, through book bills, through rights issues, and say they need money from investors. And investors were happy to give property companies. If you look at 2014, uh, the property sector raised almost 70 billion rand in new money. And that's been trending downwards. And we're saying in 2020, we're looking at about 6 billion, they're about 6, 7 billion maybe. That was mainly because of the equity raised at the beginning of the year. So the balance will come from property companies doing uh, dividend reinvestments. So of course, you're getting cash, you opt for, uh, for shares at a discounted uh, level. So that's why I find that that's dried up for property companies. So that's option one. Option two is if you can't raise equity, you sell assets. And we're seeing more and more property companies with REITs uh, on the market uh, trying to sell some assets. But it's quite challenging in terms to find a buyer at the right level. And the times may have to help the buyer as well with vendor financing as well to be able to sell some of the assets and use some of that cash to pay off our debt. So the last resort for property companies is to retain some of the income, and that's about 25%, which is taxable, unfortunately. So why are they looking to retain income? This is the biggest challenge now, because fundamentals are weakening. You know, rental income is actually slowing or even going negative in most instances. And so values will look at that and so those assets are not worth the same level as before. So these are the recent results uh, looking, uh, let's say, from uh, left to right. On the left-hand side, the companies that suffered the most was hospitality, which owns hotels, and no one's been going to hotels or traveling or domestic tourism, and you see those assets being written down. And then capital encounters in the UK, that's Covent Gardens, less tourists in London, less people going out, eating, dining, uh, so that affected those assets. And then L2D, that's Sandton City, that's uh, Eastgate, that's Melrose Arch, uh, all actually taking a, a knock in terms of valuations. On the right-hand side, you can see Napier Royal Castle, that's Eastern Europe, sort of been one of our favorite companies. We've only seen a marginal decline in valuation of about 3%. SA Corporate, mainly because of their residential exposure, which has been fairly probably defensive, as well as industrial portfolio. And Resilient, uh, the name just says Resilient, They've got good assets dominant in non-metropolitan areas, townships, rural areas, and those have held up even during our lockdown. But it's not like this has happened recently. Uh, the valuations have actually been coming down and the retail sector is probably seeing probably the biggest uh, knock. So this chart shows cap rates or capitalization rates. So as cap rates go up, your physical property values come down. And you can see whether it's the industrial sector uh, or the office sector, or the retail sector, all the sectors have been uh, feeling that pain in terms of valuations are coming down, and that's being worsened uh, by COVID-19 this year, and that's likely to continue even into 2021. So we'll probably see about 10 to 20% decline in physical property values across the sector in general. So then we come to this topic that what happens now? So see values are coming down, what are the banks going to do? So what this slide shows you, just for your information, you can see that on average, property companies, uh, the debt covenants is about 50% in terms of loan to value ratio, that's your left hand column. And then right hand side, that's your interest coverage ratio. So a typical acceptable interest coverage ratio is two times. 1.5 times some instances, but you want to go up two times. And look at the sector on average, it's about 2.7 to three times, which means it's still in a comfortable, space to pay out interest to the banks. That's the ability to pay out interest. From an LTV perspective, the average LTV for the sector right now is about 41%. Uh, percent. So for the sector to get to the 50% levels where you start reaching debt covenant, you probably need to see property values decline by about 20, 21%. Uh, percent. But that's on average. So what I've done here is just to show you, let's say, let's look at individual companies, because when we can't just average everything, so what you can see here is that uh, on the right hand side, EQU, that's equities, they'll need values to decline by 45% for them to get in trouble or to have to be negotiating with banks. Growth fund number 37, resident uh, 33. On the left hand side, 
uh, it depends how you look at it as well. If you consolidate, fully consolidate their offshore exposure, and then they probably need to talk to the banks now. If you look at on a C3 basis, there's still about 18% to go. So it's one thing you have to watch out when you look at these property companies that uh, some are more defensive than others. Some may have to raise probably equity or cut distributions to uh, adjust to the appropriate LTV levels. So where do you see LTV is going to? So as I mentioned earlier on, uh, the current LTVs for the sector, they've moved from 37% to 41%. And you see that number still going upwards and peaking out about 2022. So this number could be higher, assuming that if property companies uh, reduced their payout ratios, didn't sell assets or raise equity. So in these numbers, we're factoring in uh, lower payout ratios, disposals, to help actually reduce that LTV to not to go above the 50% levels. And talking to some uh, people, even banks as well, we believe they're probably likely to be accommodated when it comes to this covenants. And some of the companies are moving the covenant levels from the 50% levels to 55%. So we'll keep watching out for that. But reducing payout ratios, selling assets is key right now. And looking at the sector, so the market has looked at uh, the prospects and see the values are declining, but we believe the market is overreacted to this. So the property sector, is trading at about 50% below net asset value. And that's after adjusting for the recent kind of um, declines in property valuations and just still down about uh, 50%. So we don't see asset values falling by 50% over the next two years or so, given uh, some of the uh, initiatives that property companies are working on. So from this perspective, we believe that the sector is uh, looking uh, quite uh, cheap, even though the outlook is uncertain. And if you look at from differently as well, you look at to see the bond market. So all along, property is probably more in line with the bond market. So the property yield is at the line below, the till color, and then green is the bond market. So you can see in 2020, property yield spiked all the way to about 20%. That's your historic yield. So the market saying, I'm not going to get a 20% going forward. So you have to adjust for actually lower payout ratios, 25% and then declining earnings as well. That's why property is actually, uh, the gap is widened between bonds. It's not as safe as our bonds uh, compared to previously. That's why property market is looking cheap. So if we adjust for low earnings growth, lower payout ratios, you get to normalize yield on the property sector for 11%, if not 12%, not the 18 to 20% levels. So the challenge is uh, that to get to where we were before is probably unlikely compared to the bond market because uh, the fundamentals are likely to deteriorate uh, further. As you can see from this slide, the offices vacancy is going to go up um, and then on average all property sector, and the industrial probably less so, and then retail will still expect vacancies to increase uh, further over the next uh, year, actually two years because of lower economic growth less uh, usage of, of space and turns, turns going bust in some instances. Then talk about the office market, which has been quite topical, given that all of us are working, or not all of us, most of us are working from home. So I haven't been to the office uh, in the last six months, um, everything happening, and we're unlikely to go back to the offices until early next year. And then some of the big corporates are saying maybe they may don't need the same amount of space, they may have reduced by 20%, so it means over time, as leases expire, you will see less and less appetite for office space. And the challenge is that uh, the office market vacancies were growing up before. And look at it, not like Santon, uh, before just 20% vacant, and you expect those vacancies to go up uh, within 25% over the next year or so. And that's a challenge uh, to, to landlords. So what you can see, you could pick great, right? let's see your best office uh, portfolios, like brand new, like your Sassel building, Discovery, that's your pick great. Right? And then A, probably slightly older. C will be the oldest uh, office uh, blocks, which attract uh, the highest vacancies. So talking about working from home, which is very topical. So what you're seeing here in terms of uh, service, you find that uh, probably 40, about half people prefer to work one, two days actually remote uh, per, per week. So it means for the three uh, day working week. And then um, the benefits of that is well, people love that they don't have to commit, you don't get stuck in traffic at 7 a.m. 8 a.m. or coming back home at 5, 6 p.m. And then flexible hours as well. So you're able to control your, your time and uh, do some things that you couldn't do before and still be able to, to, to work 
as well as your work and life balance. So it's very a strong preference towards uh, this remote working, flexible working, and that will change the dynamics of the office space. And we believe probably usage will fall about 15, 20 uh, percent. And then over time, that will uh, increase the vacancies in the office space. So the retail sector, let's look at this slide in probably more detail because the retail sector is quite important. It's almost 60 percent of uh, the property indices. So these numbers are up to end of June, as you can see, the sales, they fell about almost 11%, and most of that due to lockdown on a year-on-year basis. And then um, if you look at April, which is basically the level five, you saw a 65% decline in sales. So basically the tenants that are operating would be the pharmacies and uh, supermarkets, and continue all the way to June, 30% decline. And we're still expecting probably August, uh, July, August as well to be uh, negative and then probably improvement in September. We've seen um, uh, improvements in food counts, and collection rates uh, going up to about 70 to 80%, and then 90% in some instances. And those numbers in terms of collections, they were lower is about 50, 60%, and 40 in some centers. But then lenders have had to give us uh, some concessions. As you can see in April, almost 63% actually discounts and deferrals given to tenants, 36% in May, and then on average, you're looking at about 40%. So that does impact on the earnings growth of the property companies. You have to do this because if you lose the tenant, it's difficult to replace them, and it's actually costly as well. And in this environment, it's all about tenant rotation as opposed to actually saying you move out, you can't pay the rent. And look at the different types of shopping centers. The numbers are up to end of June. And so like uh, the neighborhood centers, those are 12,000 square meters or lower. That's your shopping center around you where you're going to buy bread and milk. And then the bigger centers probably less impacted by vacancies because they've got more national tenants, where the smaller ones tend to have like your boutiques and smaller tenants and some restaurants that have actually closed a shop. And that's up to end of June. We expect these numbers to end of September to see that vacancies actually increase as well by another one, two percent across uh, the board. So vacancies are increasing in the retail aspect. And what's also actually making it worse is that uh, it's all these issues, people shopping online, uh, but take a lot, uh, opening my first take a lot account in, during lockdown. I used to go shopping all the time, but now you have to change your habits as well as uh, Uber Eats as well. So that does affect the size of some of those uh, centers or restaurants that need less space uh, going forward, and then online shopping as well. If you look at uh, like some like the checkers as well. It's not like everything that you do shop online, the store does not benefit. Because if they deliver in 60 minutes, it has to come from your supermarket close to you. And the supermarket actually picks up the sales across. So you have to look at it actually quite carefully that not everybody lives out of from online shopping because it comes from the store. Those are the sales of the store. So look at the uh, online trends uh, over time. South Africa almost about 3% uh, online. Compared to 0.2% about uh, six, uh, eight years ago. And that number, we don't see it going to the US levels or China levels of 18 to 25%. It's got challenges around uh, infrastructure, delivery, um, access to um, like smartphones, uh, people not comfortable with their credit cards, and the post office as well, and delivery is quite more expensive. We are a much bigger country. So it's only in the metropolitan areas, more in the high LSM areas, where you're going to see uh, that online trend pick up, but not to the same levels as uh, the other developed uh, markets. Industrial market, we believe it's going to hold up, relatively speaking, because our industrial sector has mainly been uh, distribution, warehousing, and we're seeing more interest as well in terms of uh, online related uh, activities. And our favorite company will be Equitus uh, in that uh, space. So it's very strong, and you'll see probably more interest going into the logistics market in Australia, in uh, Europe. We've seen investing in Australia by assets uh, across um, uh, Western Europe. Uh, and that's the trend that's going across the whole world in terms of the industrial sector. So supply, you're unlikely to see any probably new shopping centers coming up. So what you're seeing now in terms of construction activity is what was started a year or two years ago. Because once you start building, you have to complete it, otherwise it's going to cost you money. And then supply over time will be probably basically zero because there's no appetite for new space or new developments at this uh, and to be challenged to let some of the uh, completed speculative buildings. And this market is a tenant's market, it's not a landlord's uh, market. And how do we see the sector going forward? We'll see actually retail probably uh, 
going on from about 58% to about 55 as some of these uh, risks they sell their retail centers and then recycle the money maybe going offshore or actually to help reduce uh, the debt levels. And then office market as well, uh, product decline and the industrial sector more interested in that space. So office market and the retail sector combined at this stage, you're looking at about 75% this quite a big in the South African context. That's why we're seeing weaker earnings going forward because we've got uh, two of the biggest weakest uh, the, the weaker sectors being uh, the biggest exporter in our markets. And then offshore, that's a trend that's been going up over time. Uh, we're seeing just getting to about 50% over the next two years or so. Whereas if you look at about 2008, 2009, we had basically zero offshore exposure. And that number has gone to almost 50% and that's helped the listed property sector. In terms of trends uh, in South Africa, industrial sector probably going to hold up better in the short to medium term. Retail sector, you can see the decline. Office markets uh, over the next couple of years probably still going to be challenging given the high level of vacancies and we still like Eastern Europe from a retail perspective and the industrial across the world, big fans as well as self storage. So what's going to happen in the listed property space over the next uh, probably three years, we've seen companies working hard to restore their balance sheets, selling assets, uh, unfortunately, in tough times like this, we have to sell some of the best assets as well to uh, reduce uh, debt levels. And then uh, capital expenditure, just like all of us as well, things are tough. You're, you don't paint your house, you probably postpone that as well. So that's a worry that you may see that uh, companies cutting down on maintenance. New developments probably going to be suspended in some instances. And then dividends, if you can't meet your liquidity requirements and solvency, you may see companies suspending completely. So you may see one or two casualties in the property space the key focus to bring down LTVs. And then income uh, levels, uh, you'll see in this market, still actually a tenants market, and companies will do whatever it takes to maintain occupancy, even at lower levels, even with discounts as well. And then um, working on issues like to reduce your energy consumption, so panels and things like that. And then what's going to happen to access space? So still early days, think about the office market. So we think some of the space is going to be converted to with the storage of medical use or even schools um, or hospitals in some instances or residential as well. And that will happen over the next uh, couple of years because the space, there won't be any other alternative use. And you've seen some of the companies as well using that to do like uh, your urban farms. So you may see somebody planting their mushrooms or in the basements or in some of the office buildings that uh, no one's actually keen to take. So look at this chart, not so exciting, uh, but we believe that we'll see most of the pain over the next year. So an average property has delivered uh, distribution growth of about uh, 10% or so. But over the next year, 2020, 2021, you're looking at about 35% decline in distribution growth. So the positive numbers of 7%, you're coming up with an extremely low base uh, with some escalations of 4 or 5% in built in the leases, but the base is actually very low for 20 to 2021. To conclude in the local market, um, property fundamentals, uh, they remain weak, particularly in the office sector and the industrial sector. And then there'll be trends just emerging COVID-19 and people working from home and more online shopping in some of the markets as well. And the market remains a tenant's market. Landlords don't have bargaining power in this market. We always get questions of consolidation. I'm likely to see consolidation given that uh, there's uncertainty around the payout ratios, around the property valuations. So everybody's busy fixing their own uh, problems and you have to be quite certain how much the asset is worth before buying it. Which brings us to the property values as well. They've got so much work to do, like so many assumptions actually come up with as well. They may not come up with very actually extreme assumptions in this market and may see some of the valuations being uh, uh, delayed a bit. And then uh, global property, for offshore properties about 50%, that will help actually uh, boost um, returns, which are negative in the property space. Property valuations, if you look at the sector, it's trading at a 50% discount to NAV. And we believe actually, despite the high focus risk, it's actually looking very cheap. And we're seeing it more like bottoming out. And we're seeing lots, uh, lots of inflows actually. This week, it's been positive inflows, lots of inquiries in the property uh, space, but it's likely to be volatile. And we believe actually creates uh, entry opportunities, but be aware that there's a high focus risk in this market. And we see over a three, four year basis, about 12 to 13 percent annualized returns in the normalized yield of 11 to 12 percent. 
So that's the local markets. Then I'll move on to, to the offshore markets. Uh, that's uh, the developed markets, uh, basically. Offshore markets, uh, they fell as well, they suffered, but they recovered quicker. They up about 40% uh, from the lows of, of March, given that fundamentals have been improving, and also given that there's so many other sectors as well that you can invest in. So if you look at the right-hand side, you can invest in data centers, you can invest in tower REITs, industrial, self-storage, timber REITs, residential, and those have held up better in this on the right hand side of the chart, you can see lodging resources in hotels, retail offices have suffered uh, quite uh, the most. So the offshore markets have been boosted by so many other sectors that we don't have in South Africa, all tech related, all online related as well. And self storage as people actually uh, is benefit from online shopping, as well as people moving houses, downscaling in some instances as well. So those are the returns that we've seen, uh, nice recovery coming of uh, the offshore markets. Let's look at the long-term trends. Let me start off with the right-hand side. You can see uh, the industrial sector over time has just continued to go up this red line. And the office market had held up, and now we see that big uh, decline, mainly because of working from home. And the retail sector has been suffering for the last five years, mainly because of the industrial sector, quite well, which is all online. On the left-hand side, We've got a couple of uh, sectors. What you've got at the top of C, manufactured homes, which are basically prefabricated houses in, in the US. And think more like your RGP house in South Africa, where they're smaller, easy, and cheaper as well to, to rent. And that's held up quite well and continues to do well. Self storage, industrial apartments as well. And at the bottom, no surprise, it's malls and uh, hotels. And over the last three months, COVID crisis, measurement March, April, May, June, profit is down 10%, whereas in the GFC, it was down about 35% in 24 months. So we're seeing that recovery come through. So one thing to be aware of is that uh, property tends to overreact compared to physical property. So this slide shows the gray uh, line, that's your physical property. Uh, so you can see when a market falls, property falls much more than physical property. We saw it in 2008 and then recovers in good times overshoots the physical property market. And what we've seen in 2020, sharp decline in property, whereas physical property values have fallen, but not as much as listed uh, property. And from a pricing perspective, global property is trading um, just below NAV, about 4-5% or 5 uh, below net asset. Uh, and then you're seeing actually from a price earnings ratio as well, uh, trading more in line with the long-term uh, average. So at these levels, still looking actually fairly uh, cheap, more so given that we're expecting earnings growth to rebound. We're looking at about uh, 6 to 8% recovery in earnings growth over the next um, uh, 12 months. And I've seen some numbers as much as 15% increase in earnings in the offshore markets over the next year, and the yields about 4%. And then from an earnings yield, a property yield, that's free cash flow yield compared to S&P 500, and these numbers imply that properties actually has got 10% upside compared to its S&P 500. So everything pointing towards uh, positive returns on global uh, property. And then from a yield perspective, actually we're looking even much cheaper. So say the yield average is about 4%, and then you're looking at earnings growth being positive, but yet the gap between bond yields. So these numbers change quite a lot, but let's use this in US, for example, probably around one-ish or below. So you can see the gap almost two and a half, uh, 3%, whereas long-term average has been much, much lower. And that applies to the UK, applies to France, Hong Kong, Japan, Germany. So property from a global perspective has been oversold because of, I guess, misunderstanding in terms of uh, sectors. Everybody always thinks that uh, property is all about retail and offices, but there's actually much more uh, than those two uh, sectors. So what you've seen now is that on the physical property side, unlike in South Africa, we still expect uh, physical values to decline. At the bottom there, you can see on the left-hand side, that's basically uh, the US. Uh, over the past month, you can see a 1.3% increase in commercial property values, whereas they've declined by about 9-10% over the last 12 uh, months. And then in Europe uh, as well, about 1% uh, increase in property values. So why is that? It's because bond yields are lower, there's lots of liquidity, there's a hunt uh, for yield uh, across all these markets, given how cheap uh, property has uh, become. 
as I mentioned, um, it's quite interesting light to look at here. Lots of detail, but let's look, let's say on the right hand side. So you've got diversified sector, which is like South Africa, where some companies have got retail, they've got offices, they've got industrial. But generally this market is more specialized. So residential is probably the biggest specialized sector at about 14%, industrial 12. And then retail used to be the biggest a few years ago, but it's now actually number four is about 10%, and then offices 8%. So if we add this up, so retail plus offices in the global indices, they make up about 18%. As we mentioned, South Africa makes up 75%. So I may add a bit coming from diversified, you may say on a combined basis, retail and office only about 25% uh, globally. And I've got a choice of tower REITs, you can go healthcare, you can go hotels, you can go timber REITs, you can invest in prisons as well, and some of the energy ones. So huge diverse uh, exposure that we have across uh, these uh, segments of the market. So what do we prefer in the global space? We love the industrial sector uh, because of the growth in online uh, retail and all this supply um, chain inefficiencies and our biggest exposures with technologists, which we've talked about over the years, and the company called Fuel, that's CBS, and then you've got uh, Goodman, that's in Australia, and then WP, that's uh, the Belgian one, and then Seagro, that's a UK one. And then now we've increased our exposure to towers, data centers, biotech, these are all the names that are popping up in chat portfolios. And residential still remains one of our favorites, uh, in mainly Germany and the US, where people rent as opposed to owning, and you've seen ownership rates actually declining across most markets. And self-storage not only benefits just from uh, people moving houses, it also benefits through online shopping, uh, with facilities being as close as possible to where people uh, live. So these are our preferred sectors, and office market, very cautious on, but selective and then retail uh, for the big underweight. So what trends do we see uh, going forward in the office market? Our cent uh, REITs and uh, data centers continue to do well, industrial positive, residential probably marginal, flattish, and then picks up as well. Self-storage as well, because it goes hand in hand with residential. And then healthcare, I guess, just probably all these uh, old edge, old, uh, edge uh, people's homes, uh, where people can send that all the people as well, they will be more affected by COVID-19. And then over time, I guess with all the populations, we still need healthcare facilities and retirement villages. Office markets um, declining, but likely to stabilize over time. And then retail remains on a downward uh, trend uh, globally as online continues to grow. So how we positioned as a portfolio, this is the global property fund, just give you a sense of uh, how we're seeing the markets. Residential, we've got about 30% in the portfolio compared to the benchmark. And then um, industrial overweight as well, 24, 15. And then offices looks like neutral, because it's big underweight and diversified. We've got lots of offices there as well. And then retail, you can see as well, actually big underweight uh, position. That is um, as of 31 August. And then from a uh, geography perspective, we tend not to check, um, have big bets on regions, because one, you're taking currency risk. And this is extremely positive on the markets. We called Sweden quite right. Uh, in the office uh, sector, actually in Stockholm, that continues to do uh, quite well. But generally, in neutral in countries, prefer stock picking within the countries, and uh, we are quite flexible when it comes to uh, sector exposure. And then in the global, in global space, uh, the same uh, trends as well that we've seen. Uh, this is done by Green Street. Uh, they're looking at that uh, the weighted uh, number of days in the office will decline by about 15% uh, uh, percent uh, so that's a trend that we're seeing across uh, most um, sectors across the world. And perhaps some numbers show as much as actually uh, three days actually in the office, as opposed to like four or five days. And that's the trend that's going to happen as well in, in South Africa. And so that keeps us concerned about the future of the office market. But there are some industries that still actually need to operate in offices, and we're actually very selective on which company to choose. So if you think about the office sector, the slide, uh, what it shows, it shows actually your cost in terms of uh, offices as a percentage of your employment cost. Offices make up about 12%. Uh, just show you that office market is probably not as expensive as, let's say, the retail sector, where actually occupants cost up 53% of your employment uh, cost. So if you're in the right office uh, segment, in the right locations, where the industry will still need to be in offices, and targeting some of the big corporates or head offices with who will still need to interact we believe that there are some opportunities. 
because the market has been more than actually discounted the impact of COVID-19. So some of this may relate with as well, why we need offices, it's company culture as well. We need employee engagement. We want to actually uh, have physical meetings. In some markets like Asia, where apartments are like 20 square meters, 30 square meters, it's just difficult for people to work from, from home. And if you look at uh, what I say, working from is unequal. So more senior and wealthy employees have got uh, better facilities at home and fiber and space and study rooms, whereas uh, junior people don't have that as well and they actually can't operate. In the Slovakian context, we do have problems with data issues, connectivity issues, as well as ESCOM when it comes to uh, load shedding. It's just difficult to operate uh, from home, have backup power, you know, or have not a good UPS as well to keep it going for the day. So that's where offices come in. But then the market has to change as well that the length of lease is going to change. There's going to be more flexible offices, uh, short, so like one, two month leases, or bed covers probably slightly longer, but flexibility is going to be important. And then uh, capital requirements required for your mental well-being health as well, like whether it's uh, air conditioning, piping, space, ventilation as well. All these offices need to be reconfigured, and that's actually big capex for landlords, also for actually tenants as well, for their employees to fill us. Some of our preferred companies in the office market, we we're looking at opportunities where the market is actually overly discounted this impact of uh, working from home. Over the US companies on the left, there's Kilroy, they've got like Alexandria, and then Boston Properties, that's a big uh, office lender in the US. And then Fabergé, that's uh, a Swedish uh, company, then we've got Colonial, that's in Spain, and then Jacina in France, and then Dale in London uh, in, in the UK. They've got the best office building, well, well occupied, and we believe these companies are looking cheap. So global property, just to uh, conclude, if you look at uh, the right hand side, you can see the input of the global financial uh, crisis, which was a massive fall and then the property market recovered. And then COVID-19, as we mentioned, we saw like almost 40% uh, recovery over the last uh, couple of months from the first month of uh, March. And we believe there's still uh, lots of opportunities in this market, it's quite small. We have about 5% of the assets, listed assets, compared to the total global uh, property assets. Benefits from diversification, from liquidity. On the left-hand side, there's probably more an economic slide. We all uh, probably believe that interest rates are going to be lower for longer, inflation lower as well, and that uh, supports uh, the property uh, market. So, so where we see opportunities is that uh, economic growth, yes, yeah, going to be negative in 2020, and then we'll see a bounce back in 2021. Uh, low inflation, lower funding costs as well, do help the property companies as this debt comes up for renewal at lower levels. And supply is well. still a big challenge in most of the developed markets. We just can't build. The location is very key, and the amount of money that's coming to support all these economies is unbelievable and will help to boost the property markets. And these markets are very simple, uh, good corporate governance, good management experience as well. And you've got so many sectors to choose from. As you mentioned that the sectors that we never talked about five years ago when I was presenting, or 2015, my first presentation at the JSC, we never talked too much about towers, uh, data centers, manufactured housing, and those have been growing quite a lot. And then you still see good growth opportunities in the industrial sector residential and uh, self uh, storage. So that's the global property uh, story. Um, so we still uh, like global property, but we believe that local property has got uh, good opportunities if you're willing to ride through the volatility and the valuations are just unbelievably cheap. It's just price the property market as if it's coming from the default. And property cameras on average are about 20% away uh, from defaulting the banks in terms of asset values falling. And they've got uh, so many things in place to help um, run, uh, run away from that risk of uh, default. But there will be casualties in one or two, and that creates negative headlines. But we believe most of the companies are working towards fixing their balance sheets in challenging times. So that's.
that's uh, my story. Uh, Simon, over Keenan, to you. Thank you. Uh, folks, if you've got questions, drop them into the Q&A box. We've got a couple coming in. A, a, a question that's been asked by a, a couple of the folks is, with interest rates in South Africa having come down, what, 3% uh, this year, are, are property companies able to take advantage of that in terms of renegotiating, perhaps getting lower rates on their, their, their debt that they have, or, or were those rates already floating or perhaps long term? So, uh, to a certain extent, uh, so the property sector, we have fixed the debt for on average uh, three years, so two and up to three years. So, 80% of the debt is fixed. So, the one that benefits from lower interest rates is about 20%. So, as debt comes up for renewal, it's probably 10 to 20% a year, or 20% a year, that will benefit as well. So, that helps in terms of uh, earnings growth uh, to be not as bad as it seems. So, yes, there's a benefit, but 20% immediately and then the other 20% per year. Okay, so there's a, a small bit of benefit. Uh, another question, uh, Terence, so asking, uh, asking about Into, they're obviously into uh, business rescue out of the UK. My sense is having looked into it, it, it looks like shareholders are probably going to get nothing from the the, 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 the the remains of Into when they wind that up. Is that a fair comment? That's 100% fair. It's unfortunate that... Uh, they are in the retail space, as we mentioned, that the retail sector is likely to continue to decline mm -hmm. in terms of valuations, fundamentals, and then depends what kind of retail. So interest retail was dominant 10, 15 years ago, but they never adapted to the changing trends, online shopping, food, beverage, entertainment, younger people as well. So the assets, they even they needed work actually even before as well. So it's it's a very sad story, I must say. I remember seeing the assets in 2007 for the first time, they're unbelievable. But now it's basically worth nothing. Because the problem is the structure of the world, and it's very much simple. It's like, it's like a spider web in terms of to untangle that is unbelievable. I don't know why they got into that uh, complex debt uh, structure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jane, you're asking if the presentation will be available. Yep. Video will be up uh, in a couple of hours at uh, justonelap.com. We'll have that up there in a moment. Um, uh, Terence also asks, he says on your valuation slide, you didn't have redefine. Is, is, is it a stock you don't like, don't follow a particular reason about it? <laughs> so I did talk about redefine a bit that uh, you're just watching the LTV. So redefine has been doing a couple of things as well. Uh, it's just been a very uh, complex business and they've been working to simplify it. So even before COVID, they were paying out trading profits, they had exported in Australia, and then uh, student housing, mm -hmm. basically everything. So what uh, management has been doing now, uh, and they've been caught with the put structure from all of the South, they've simplified that as well. So it's been going through the simply uh, the cashing process, and the LTV is high, they still need to fix the LTV, they need to sell the assets, they've sold some offshore assets as well. So it's a company as well, we've seen the shippers, how volatile it's become as well. And the nice come down again as well. So at these levels, it's probably, probably more um, difficult to predict the earnings, but my management is working hard. We're looking at earnings falling by 45% uh, for the uh, calendar, for the financial. And then we have to look at going forward as well. So there's prospects there as well, but there's high focus risk. What about a, a couple of questions? I'm going to put them into in, into one in a sense. I mean, we've got the the, the requirement to pay out their their, their distributions. Uh, that 75% of distributable income needs to be paid out. Are there are there things that we should look out for that companies might try to? You know, the, the one suggestion is you know they change their year end. I think uh, probably they're not going to get away with that. Are there some red flags we should be looking in, in that space, or is it fairly clear cut? Either they're going to do it within the timeline or they miss it and, and it will be very apparent. So it's, it's very clear, actually, I'll say, because the regulation is simple. You have to pay out 75%. Unless you meet your um, liquidity and solvency requirements, then probably may not uh, pay. But so that's very clear, unless you can meet those two requirements. And then 75%, uh, and whatever you don't pay out is taxable. And then if you don't do that, then you, you lose your rate status. And mm -hmm. when you come back again to your rate, it'll take you two years. And then by losing the tax implications, covered against implications, so you don't want to be in that kind of uh, position. And the market will be watching out for that. So the market research and uh, corporate governance of the property space has improved a lot that we'll be watching for all these uh, changes or 
potential funds. And, and could a rights issue, I mean, obviously, it's, this is not a market that to raise capital in, and particularly at the current valuations, but in essence, they could do a rights issue and use that for the, the, the distribution because that rights issue is not distributable income. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a tough one as well. Like uh, that's a challenge with raising equity because to raise equity when a share price is trading at uh, 60, 70, 80% of the NAV. So that would be the last result, like what you saw with Intu and, and, and Hamasin as well. Um, so if you see a company raising equity now, it's just it should be one, the uptick probably uh, going to be low, mm -hmm. and two, then count the share price on an overly discounted share price while raising. So that would be um, quite an extreme uh, last resort measure. I know uh, Eastern Europe has long been a, a, a favorite of yours. Uh, is Nepi still one of the, the, the preferred on our local market? Yes, Nepi is still one of the preferred. Um, so the asset value is falling from 3% and then most of the malls, I guess probably they're moving to winter now, you can see, try to pick up negative news, but they don't have uh, too much uh, development uh, risk. Do, and the quality of their malls, they're dominant and uh, they're new as well, so there's capex required and they've got the latest uh, concept. And from an LTV perspective as well, the LTV is still quite manageable, just below 35% compared to some of the comparable rates, which are over 50% in Eastern Europe. Yeah, okay. Like you say, it, yeah. Um, and then what about the granddaddy of our, of our property sector, Growth Point? I mean, obviously, they've got some Australia, um, they've got some uh, holding some Australia assets, and they've got the, the v &A waterfront, which is really foreign tourist focused. Mm -hmm. uh, Growth Point, it, it really has, I mean, there was a time when that stock was probably half of the, the SAPI index. Yes, yes. So Growth Point, uh, they've done quite well uh, with uh, offshore diversification, um, Australia mainly, and then Eastern Europe. UK didn't work out quite well with the um, capital regional. Mm -hmm. We've seen the market as being quite a lot uh, when they went in last year post Brexit. So timing wise, didn't work out well. So VNA is still a challenge uh, given the amount of tourists. We're not, we're not going to see pretty much tourists even in December when uh, most we used to travel from overseas with all the travel restrictions. Uh, from a valuation perspective, growth point, we prefer it. Um, this is over really fine. Um, um, valuation so them fall by about 8.8 percent .8 and it's quite diversified uh, with retail offices industrial and offshore so and in terms of governance and disclosure we believe they actually stand uh, quite uh, ahead of uh, everybody else so, or most of the other routes yeah. Yeah, fair point on that. Fortress, uh, folks asking about that. The distinction between the Fortress A and Bs, and I'm going to test my own memory here. If I understand Fortress A's get a inflation-linked increase in distribution, and then the Bs get the rest of the distribution. That's right, yes. So in this, mar this market favors basically your A units. There's two or three other risks with the A and B structure. So your A structure is your bond-like instrument. So the B units benefit in the good times. And we've seen them actually, like when Fortress B was flying during good times, and now it's actually underperforming because of the enemy's outlook. And actually, this year, the B is not getting a distribution because everything goes to the A units. So we prefer the A units compared to the B units. And what Fortress is looking to do is to actually combine the A and B units and just have it as one company. And the challenge is how do you meet uh, the requirements or the demands from the A unit holders mm. who want to get a paid a premium? Each others have suffered quite a lot as well. So it's an ongoing debate with investors and management, and they haven't come up with a solution yet. Yeah, okay, I get you. Collapsing that structure is not going to be easy. Here's a great question. So towers, and, and if folks are thinking, you know, towers, and you're thinking skyscrapers, towers, if I'm correct, towers are the mm -hmm. sort of the mobile towers, which take our mobile telecommunications and the yes, like. Right. Is 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 is, is yes. sort of Elon Musk has got his satellites going into orbit for internet and and the like. Does that put some threat into the tower business, or are they very much different? The satellites really more internet uh, uh, rather than terrestrial. So I was, I was uh, we were talking about earlier today. Actually, actually, you'll still need to use the towers as well. So you'll probably have that, but the tower still needs actually to be able to go ahead with that project and uh, deliver on that project. You can't just do it without using the towers. And also like towers, because once you build a tower as well, you can add on actually more providers there as well, because the tower is actually yeah. in place already, and that's additional income, and your capital is done. 
Uh, last question coming through. Uh, the, the, you mentioned uh, self-storage. Uh, it's certainly it, it's it's a it's a it's a sector I know that you've liked for many many years. We've got the one example in South Africa, which is storage. Um, is 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 that a, a, an investment that you like locally? Yes. Um, so uh, a lot of times, actually, held me. <laughs> I've opened my first uh, storage uh, plant, self storage, with them as well. So it just shows that you want to create more space, you move in, or just to create the study where I am here, uh, some extra stuff, then you check the storage. So that's probably one. And then people moving houses, um, probably downgrading as well. Uh, you're seeing that happen, as well as a small business SMEs as well, using that space as well for online or delivery as well. So it's one of our preferred picks. And they've also expanded to the UK as well. Yes. So UK, yes, you can see this Brexit, this weakness, but the market works in the UK. And self storage is one of our overweight, uh, storage is one of our overweight positions in the portfolio. Yeah, I, I actually just used it as well um, during lockdown. And it's just such a slick service. I was just mm -hmm. like, deeply, deeply impressed with it. Uh, Carl is asking uh, mm -hmm. about Hammerson. Um, they obviously just done a giant dilutive rights issue. Post rights issue, are, are, are they attractive or is there a long way back for them? So we believe uh, they've got a new CEO as well who comes from private equity yeah. space. Uh, their job is turning around the businesses, lots of inefficiencies as well. Probably cut costs, um, restructure the business, and really the pricing as well. You've got the cash now, and the valuation is at the lowest levels um, ever. And we believe there's opportunities going forward. That's so why we've seen the likes of Resilient as well invest quite heavily in Lighthouse in, in Hamilton. Because uh, remember, retail isn't totally uh, dead. Mm -hmm. It's once about liquidity and the capital and the right assets. And at these levels, it's been heavily punished. Uh, but we believe at, um, at this level is attractive. Yeah, we saw that spur update today, which amazed me. They they're doing, you know, it, it, it's it's sit down dining, but that's for the retail space. Um, and their uh, trading update was very positive. And in fact, uh, Pierre Fontonda said that they are trading well ahead of where they thought they would in terms of occupancies at their restaurants. Mm -hmm. a, a question coming through: We don't have uh, Killian, if I'm correct, we don't have any tower country uh, companies in South Africa. We would be looking offshore for those. Yeah, it's offshore, unfortunately. So we believe over time, maybe over the next five years, with this data centers, towers, given the growth in this industry, more so data centers as well, those opportunities could come through to South Africa. We've visited one or two which are privately held, mm -hmm. and they still need, to, need probably more capacity as well. So there's those are opportunities going forward. Ladies and gents, we will park it there. I'm not seeing any more questions coming through. I uh, appreciate your time for all coming this evening. As I said, video up uh, in a couple of hours on the Just One Lab website. Uh, Kenyon and Gluville, thank you very, very much, sir. Really appreciate your time. Always appreciate your insights. We, we, we always leave these events way smarter about property. Uh, thank you very, very much. Thanks, Simon, and thanks to Jason as well. Pleasure. Cheers, all. Have a good evening further.